Hi, everybody, and welcome back again um, to our first of our panel sessions. Um, so I'm very uh, happy to introduce today's facilitator um, for the panel session, adjunct associate professor at the University of Notre Dame, but probably better uh, known as ABC reporter uh, from National Medical Reporter for the ABC, Sophie Scott. Uh, in addition to being a prominent uh, public speaker at MC, Sophie's won numerous awards for excellence in medical and health journalism, including an Australian Museum Eureka Award and multiple awards from various professional medical colleges. Uh, Sophie regularly appears on the ABC News, uh, but also on my favourite TV show, The 730 Program, uh, and ABC Online. Um, she's been a guest host on RN's Health Report and is a frequent guest on Dr. Glover's ABC Sydney Drive Program. Uh, she's also the author of two books. She's a very busy person. I don't know how you have time to do panels. Um, author of two books, uh, Live a Longer Life and Road Testing Happiness, and also writes a po popular blog on positive psychology. So thanks, Sophie, for making the time to facilitate today. Thank you, James, and um, welcome, everybody. Uh, that's for that very nice introduction. We're going to be talking about the uh, clinical perspectives on activity-based funding, and as, as you've been hearing over the day today, the theme for the conference is response, relevant and reliable. And so that's some of the themes we're going to talk about in this discussion as well. We know that activity-based funding has been a success, but that it also needs to be tweaked as we go through. And that's something we'll discuss in this session. If you're on social media, um, I, lo I love social media. I think it's a great place. There's a lot of uh, doctors and scientists on social media and people interested in, in hospitals and health and funding. So if you're on social media, if you're on Twitter, um, the Twitter handle for IPA is IHPA News, and mine is Sophie Scott and the number two. And if you're on Instagram as well, um, mine is Sophie Scott and the number two, and I post a lot of content there. If you're on LinkedIn, um, you can go to the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority's website, and the hashtag for today is hashtag ABF21. So don't forget to tag IPA in any tweets or posts or anything, and then we can see them and then they can repost them. So this session today, I'll introduce the panel in a minute, but the idea with this session is to give the clinician's view of the challenges of working in an activity-based funding environment. We'll look at how the tools can be used to drive improvement in services, and then the impact of the quality funding adjustments, things like you know, Sentinel events, hospital-acquired complications, and avoidable readmissions, something that I'm sure most of you are very aware of. There'll be uh, 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. So if you do have any questions for the panel, you can see that the live Q&A, that's the place where we want you to be asking your questions and I'll, I'll ask them at the end. So first of all, uh, please welcome our panel. I'll give you just brief introductions of them. If you if you look, you can see their full biographies um, in, the, in the virtual portal. But first of all, we have Associate Professor Alistair MacDonald. He's the Chair of the Clinical Advisory Committee of the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. He's a physician working as the Director of Medicine in Tasmania with a small private practice. Uh, he's Chair of the Clinical Advisory Committee to IPRA, as I mentioned, and also on the Healthcare Homes Implementation Advisory Committee. So please give him a big virtual wave. Welcome, Alistair. Thank you for being here. Thanks uh, we, for have me. we have Dr. Robert Herkes, the Chief Medical Officer of Ramsey Healthcare Australia. I'm sure he's very well known to many in the audience as he was Chief Medical Officer at the Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare before that. Uh, and he's a leader in intensive care medicine um, and he's also uh, has held positions as Director of intensive, intensive Care at RPA and Strathfield Private Hospital. I think I first met Robert when he was at RPA during swine flu, so it's been been a while, so welcome. Been, didn't we? Hi. Yeah, we did. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for come, being come here. Circle. It has. So uh, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Linda Swan. She's the Chief Medical Officer of Medibank, and her role is to provide clinical leadership across Medibank to ensure that all their health programs and initiatives are safe and high quality and aligned with clinical frameworks and standards. And that ensures that private health insurance products are designed to improve health outcomes and that governance pro uh, processes are all in place and best practice. So please welcome Dr. Linda Swan. Give her a little wave, everybody. Welcome, Dr. Swan. And we have Dr. Zoe Weiner. She's the Director of Clinical Governance and Medical Director of Bupa Australia and New Zealand. She's the Chair of the Board of Dental Health Services Victoria. 
and the director on the board of the Victorian Responsible Gambling Foundation. She has a clinical background in cardiothoracic surgery and she was just giving us some, some tips earlier on the best way to wear a mask when you wear glasses. So a woman of many talents. So please welcome Dr. Zoe Wainer. Give her a wave. And last but not least, Kathy Jones, who is the Chief Quality and Risk Officer at TLC Healthcare. Uh, Kathy has 25 years experience in public and private hospitals with qualifications in speech pathology and an MBA. And she represents the private sector on many important commissions and lectures internationally. And I'm sure as many of you know, and if you don't already, you need to subscribe to the popular No Harm Done podcast. So welcome, Kathy, and well done on your podcast. The uh, people from IPA were telling me they're big fans of your podcast. So if you don't already subscribe to that podcast, I highly recommend that you do. So welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for your time. So I'm going to start um, asking all of you about the impact of activity-based funding for clinicians in the hospital setting. And we'll go through each, uh, each of our panellists to get some feedback. Let's start with, with Robert first. Um, so thanks, Sophie. Um, it's a really interesting question because, in fact, most doctors and nurses and allied health professionals don't understand anything much about activity-based funding at all and uh, sort of see it as something that the administrators sort out with the jurisdictions and the Commonwealth. Uh, so many don't have the vaguest idea. Lots of clinicians rail about, say, in intensive care. The intensive care tends to be a, a uh, income generator for hospitals and they rail about the fact that the at least on paper, the activity-based funding for their intensive care might be multiples, multiple millions more than actually gets spent within the intensive care. And uh, they don't understand the process where, in fact, the activity-based funding uh, that, that IPA uh, help with and do the national efficient price actually goes to the uh, jurisdictions and the uh, at a, at a uh, health um, network level and doesn't directly go to their unit or their service and uh, it's up then to the to the administrators of the hospital service and the health service uh, to apportion the money as you would expect. Uh, the IPA uh, activity-based funding system hasn't been implemented in many of the states mm -hmm. so things like hacks and uh, central events has been implemented universally but the cost adjustments for hospital acquired complications has been implemented differently in each of the states. Uh, so uh, it's really complicated. Mm. And uh, it's only people like Alistair who has an interest in, in funding models uh, that will really understand uh, fully how uh, case mix funding actually affects clinical services. I think one of the really important things though that has been achieved through case mix funding is because there's standardization, it's led to standardization of process and standardisation of care pathways. And that's an evolving thing, but I think that's really done lots to improve care. So, you know, day of, day of surgery admissions and what have you uh, has been driven by the fact that there's uh, a, an efficient price and that efficient price uh, therefore sets some of the standards that you need to achieve. Oh, thanks, Robert. So, Alistair, you've been nominated as the as the next in line to answer this. So give, give us your perspective, um, your unique perspective on this and the impact from where, from where you sit on, the, uh, on clinicians from activity-based funding. I think Robert's uh, stolen an awful lot of my, of my thoughts there. Um, but I think there's no doubt that uh, initially clinicians uh, had very little interest or understanding of activity-based funding and, uh, and that that um, you know, has only gradually evolved uh, as, they, uh, as we've moved into other areas like the quality and safety area and some of the other areas. But prior to that, there was certainly a sense that uh, oh, this was going to be uh, this was going to be good because the, the more procedures they did, the more money we got, and uh, and no real understanding that the budgets etc. were still going to be relatively capped, uh, and that it was a matter of uh, performing these things in an efficient way uh, within the uh, within the nationally efficient price and the appropriate adjustments. I don't think there's any doubt that one of the things that has gone forward in most of our organisations is coding um, and the coding uh, people in every hospital now are probably the most valuable people uh, in respect of, uh, of determining uh, the, the 
the funding allowance for the work we're doing. Uh, and certainly that has clearly filtered down into the, uh, into the area of clinicians and, uh, and as department heads, um, you know, we're very keen to make sure that, uh, that we're coding very accurately and that's improved uh, hospital documentation uh, and a number of other uh, factors of that nature. Um, the, from, uh, from other perspectives, I mean, I think much of the other advantages uh, that clinicians have gained from this and that the health system has gained come from the, the uh, initiatives that have occurred and we're going to talk about later with regard to quality and safety. So, so I'm happy to, to talk more about that when we get to the, those areas. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so maybe we'll move to, to Cathy now. What's, what's your view in terms of the, the impact on clinicians if, if you have seen any, anything so far? Well, I think it's, um, it's increasing. I think, you know, traditionally activity-based funding was, you know, well understood and an area of interest only for health information managers, as we mentioned before, health department administrators knew all about it and uh, economists. And if you're lucky, maybe one member of your board even understands a, a little bit about it. Um, you know, in the olden days, the health information managers were stuck away in the, in the basement of the hospital. Um, people don't usually go into that role if they want to be a gregarious communicator. And it is very, very difficult to um, communicate all the nuances of how the funding really ties back to the care delivered. And I think at least trying to introduce this quality component, the sentinel events, the, um, the, the hospital readmissions, the, the hack rate, the hospital by complications has really got the care and the funding back to what it really means to look at value here and whether or not it, it engages clinicians more. I think it, it actually irritates a lot of clinicians to have non-risk adjusted uh, complications being uh, impacted in, into funding, but it is a starting point where we can say that at, at least here the clinicians know more about this particular topic and they are able to contribute and it, it gets the engagement and the conversation going. So I think that every move in this direction is really positive. Australia is leading the world in, in this area in a lot of respects. And we are also, you know, we're flowing through our activity-based funding conversations into how can this apply now to mental health, how can it apply to some other block funding areas, and how can it apply even into aged care. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity for enhancing the positive aspects of activity-based funding and moving them forward. And in these other models for mental health, for example, engaging the clinicians better from the start would be a really good way of commencing here. Interesting, and we'll, we'll talk more about the specifics of those, some of the things you mentioned in a moment, but we'll just move on to, to Zoe. Um, what are your thoughts and, and, and views about the impact on clinicians or their views about activity-based funding? Thanks, Sophie. Um, look, I certainly resonate with a lot, of, a lot of what Cathy was just referring to. I think um, we've seen an evolution of funding in healthcare and there are now uh, lots of different models and ways to fund. I actually think it's really important to start with the clinical model and what are the best outcomes that we want to achieve and how do we get there and then think about what the appropriate funding model is that will drive that behaviour both at the system level as well as the clinician level. Um, so I think really bringing in that, you know, quality and safety components and the hacks, but also moving towards how do we actually recognise outstanding outcomes, um, really good outcomes that matter to the patients, I think will be another kind of ev evolution of how we look at funding and its interrelationship with clinical models. And what sort of, I might just, just, just on that, Zoe, just ask you, so what sort of difference would that make if there was, you know, if, you, if you're looking at, say, the carrot and stick approach, if you had that carrot approach, what sort of difference would that make? Look, I think I'm a big fan of the carrot approach. I think it allows people to engage in a really positive way in the process and the development of, say, the funding model or the clinical care let's say, starting with the clinical model. Uh, and I think actually uh, I find clinicians, when they are empowered in that space, are actually quite interested and actively engaged, but often they're not empowered or engaged in those processes. So I think um, bringing the carrot into that, uh, and the carrot not just for clinicians, but also uh, for patients and co-designing those models of care, I think is critical. And then thinking about the funding as a consequence of that development, I think is, is the best way to ensure good outcomes for the health system. Oh, good, good point. I know I do quite a lot in mental health and certainly co-design um, of, of services that is definitely very big at the moment, very important. Uh, so Linda, uh, I might ask you the same question about, from your view, what, what's been the impact of um, activity-based funding for clinicians that you've seen? Yeah, 
Look, what we see um, in the private health insurance sector is quite a lot of confusion about what's funded, by whom, and what are the impacts of different decisions that are made um, on funding. And I think, unfortunately, some of the other conversations about a lack of engagement with uh, funding by a lot of clinicians and back to our training days, you know, there's not a lot of time spent in medical training on funding. And there seems to be in many uh, clinicians' mind a sense that my job's looking after the individual, my job is not to think about funding, that somebody else's job doesn't really concern me. And so the times when we get um, contacted by clinicians is when they're really annoyed. They've heard some terrible story about how we're no longer funding this vital piece of technology and it's a version of the truth, if I can describe it that way. So what you'll find is that um, because it's really complex, all the details about why a decision made is difficult um, to convey to clinicians and they get a very shortcut approach. Like um, they're told that um, the health insurer doesn't pay for this person to stay in hospital beyond three days. What actually what's happening is that they're getting less money for the stay after that time frame, not no money. And then we get the outrage call to say, why aren't you paying? It's outrageous that you don't pay. Um, so there is a whole piece of educating and engaging clinicians with funding and funding models. I'm, a big fan of things like activity-based funding. I mean, it, the idea that we have a model that's trying to look at um, value and trying to encaps encapsulate some of the complexity of care is great, but we've got to do a better job of communicating, engaging clinicians. And we're all smart, clever people, so there's got to be a way that we can do it better and ensure we, we get people on board with what um, is happening around funding. So we might just talk now about the fact that um, activity-based funding and other sort of innovative tools are, are being used to, to drive improvement. But And we might just uh, focus on what the challenges are, exist or are expected when those models sort of evolve and change. Maybe we'll start with Alastair. What, what are some of the, the challenges or uh, that need to sort of be, be managed as, as the models evolve? I think one of the important challenges that we're that we're grappling with is the uh, is the continuum between the outpatient um, sector and particularly the primary health sector and the hospital sector. As we look at hospitals across the country, and uh, mine is certainly no exception, uh, access block uh, and uh, uh, is is a serious problem. And as a, and as ABF largely uh, funds uh, the inpatient sector. Uh, Despite the fact that there are there are ways in which the outpatient sector can be uh, can be coded and uh, counted, um, the the sense that uh, that we are not putting the resources that we could into appropriate admission avoidance um, and uh, and to look at novel new ways of uh, of bringing some of that uh, specialist and uh, uh, and hospital expertise into the community to to uh, try and reduce uh, the the flow of uh, of the um, of patients into the emergency department, uh, and certainly we're looking at options in that respect. Uh, the the clinicians on the floor uh, see you know, see a, a resource constrained environment with uh, uh, with money, but particularly with infrastructure and human resources being a significant issue, uh, and uh, and in that context uh, they. They see the challenges of the patients that you know, that are arriving with with well advanced pathology that could potentially have been managed in the in the private in the public sector uh, in the community rather than uh, rather than uh, ending up in the uh, in the sector of the hospital system. And so I think that's one of the things that we need to look at: how we either capitation or bundled. Um, funding options can be looked at uh, providing that sort of hospital type care in the community, in residential aged care, uh, and, and in, in many of our block funded uh, facilities in, in small district hospitals, etc. And before we move on from you, Alistair, I might just ask you about the, the issue of the, um, the avoidable readmissions when that's introduced. What do you think, how do you think that's likely to be received and, and what, what, are, what do you think, what are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, I think of of the initiatives, the avoidable readmissions is, uh, and, and how you define avoidable um, mm -hmm. is one of the ones that's most, most significantly contested by uh, by clinicians and. And, and I think there are potential unintended consequences, uh, particularly with respect to length of stay. You know, the the so-called, in inverted commas, trial of discharge uh, in, in many of these patients uh, will, will be is certainly disincentivized by uh, by readmissions. But there's some good stuff going on. There's no doubt that some of the frequent flyer programs that are occurring uh, where, uh, where complex case coordination in the community uh, is being used to maintain uh, these patients who had potentially avoidable readmissions. So there's been investment in that sort of, uh, mm. sort of resources uh, occurring, uh, which is incentivized by some of these, uh, some of these measures. So I might just go to the other panellists just to, to discuss the same issue about the challenges that as the funding models um, evolve. Um, maybe Cathy, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you. What, what do you see as some of the challenges that might that exist and, and, the, and what's the likelihood to be when the, uh, the avoidable, avoidable readmissions is, is introduced? Yeah, look, I think um, challenges in, in general are that, that it is difficult to, to roll all of these uh, new initiatives out at a, at a pace and keep every state going at the same time in the same direction. So I think just our competing, and a few of the other panellists have mentioned this already, the competing sort of federal versus state health system uh, with primary care being separate, but also just the different pace of uptake of the different various state health departments in even passing on the penalties and bonuses with the with the hospital acquired complications. That's been a bit of an obstacle, I would say, you know, some of the states and certainly the private sector actually are way ahead of some other states because it, the, the impact has not been passed on in the way it was intended in the funding model. So I think that's, you know, as always, our, our different layers of health funding and government is, is a bit of an obstacle. And when you work across a national organisation like I have, you really do see this in stark reality compared to if you work within a particular state. And I think that there's not enough people who do work across all states and actually visibly see that that problem and that blockage in, in operation. Mm. Another, just another, um, another obstacle to the, the funding innovation is the risk adjustment and trying to get the risk adjustment right in order to be valid and get the credibility that the clinicians need in order to trust the funding model. So I think the risk adjustment continually evolving is really challenging and IPA's just doing a fabulous job with the, um, the Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare at trying to get that right. And just as a final comment, you know, measuring hacks, hospital readmissions and, and uh, and sentinel events is not very engaging for the consumer. So I think the final stage is we're not really connect, collecting the data that is gonna really get the, the, the person who's sick, the resident, the consumer, the patient um, on board with this. And so it, it is a funding model, but I think that engaging with more patient reported outcome measures is another step that's you know another hard um, hurdle to come over. But I think that that's a really important step as well. So I might stop there with those three. Yeah, I think I think that last point that you mentioned is really important, and certainly from my point of view, where anything I when I am reporting on health or you know in doing health stories, I'm always thinking about it from the patient's point of view. Mm -hmm. And if the patient and the consumer was understanding that the system was this system was being set up to keep you out of hospital as much as possible, I think having that sort of buy-in would actually make people more engaged and understand that this is why you're you know the funding you're getting funded this way to have some care outside the hospital and some care inside the hospital. And, you know, with these, some of those new um, funding models, which um, are designed to give like more follow-up care, for example, when people leave hospital. Um, and I think if people, if patients could see that it was all designed to keep you out of, because let's face it, no one really wants to go to hospital. Um, but for people with those chronic and complex illnesses, if there can be a, a tweak to how it's funded so that they do get that more support, then that's, probably going to be a win-win situation. Uh, so Robert, I might just go to you um, to get your point of view about the challenges and also uh, how you see things evolving with the, um, with the avoidable readmissions coming in soon. So I think both Alistair and um, Cathy have hit it on the head, the nail on the head. Uh, we don't have an integrated healthcare system. We've got a primary care system that's funded completely separately from the acute care system uh, and uh, they're not integrated. And most of the patients that we're most concerned about are people who are comorbid. They've got, you know, diabetes. They've got chronic obstructive airways disease. They've got mm -hmm. hypertension. They've got renal impairment. 
and so on. And having an integrated system where primary care and acute care are actually hooked together and can do things to try and prevent admissions, prevent readmissions, uh, and uh, put people on a pathway. There, there are uh, numerous evidence-based pathways, say for chronic obstructive airways disease, how to prevent hospitalisation, how to optimise care at home. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the way our funding models are structured with primary care principally being paid for by uh, fee-for-service by the Commonwealth and the states and the Commonwealth sharing and the private sector sharing responsibility for uh, paying for uh, acute care, uh, they're not integrated. All the states uh, are moving towards uh, what they're calling value-based care. Now, value-based care takes patient-reported outcome measures and patient-reported experience measures and tries to measure the value of the admission uh, and move the system towards uh, acknowledging the really vital role that, uh, that consumers and patients within our system uh, uh, perform and their needs as opposed to the system's needs. Uh, so I think we're, we're all moving there, but what would really be good is if we could figure out a way to integrate primary care and mm -hmm. acute care uh, as well as aged care uh, into a system that, because it's the same patient, patients tra traversing systems with different funders, with different drivers uh, and without uh, an integration. Uh, so I, I think both Cathy and Alistair are right on the money. It's there that things need to be proved. And just a little plug for our panel discussion tomorrow that we're going to be having uh, with some of the, the state health authorities, and that's the value-based health care. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tomorrow in the panel discussion. So just a little plug for the audience there. If you're interested in that, make sure to tune into our panel discussion tomorrow. Uh, Robert, before we move on, I was, I'm interested in just getting your, your feedback, having been in the at the Commission on Quality and Safety and now in the private system um, what you see, how you, your perspective might have changed or evolved as you see a different side of um, the health system, you know, whether it comes to funding and things like that? Um, so I think uh, clearly I've only been with Ramsey now for three weeks, so I'm uh, <laughs> really uh, at the moment extraordinarily naive. I'm much, much happier <laughs> to answer things about the Commission than I am at, about Ramsey so far. Um, but, but one of the things that's completely underappreciated in our system is the complementarity of the private sector and the public sector. And they do actually act in, in complementary to each other in complementary ways. And uh, because it's only really crises like our influenza pandemic and this, uh, you know, the current COVID pandemic, where uh, there's an appreciation that both systems are there to support patients and patient care. Uh, and that we need to work out a way to properly um, you know, understand that they're both complementary and they both add value for our community, which is what we're all here to serve. Um, I think there are things in the in the private system that because of, of uh, wanting to drive care for individual patients are probably uh, more refined and further advanced than in the public system. And there are other things like the coding that Alistair was mentioning earlier that are probably uh, more advanced within the within the public system. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've had to do that to to ensure they've got an adequate flow of funding. So I think they're at different stages, and some things are more advanced in one system versus the other. Uh, but we need to recognise through COVID that without the private system, uh, potentially the public system would have been crushed. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of the jurisdictions, so for instance, Queensland is sending significant amounts of public surgical work into private hospitals because at the moment the, the public hospitals can't cope with the, the load because of the shutdowns and uh, the implications of COVID. Oh, well, thank you for that perspective and I appreciate it's only been three weeks. So we, <laughs> we do appreciate that your, your, uh, your thoughts there. So just sticking with our question about the challenges, I think um, we'll go to Linda next. Hi, yeah, thank you, Sophie. Um, look, I completely agree with Rob. There's, you know, in an ideal world, we provide a single source of funding that goes across all aspects of a person's healthcare. I think we're all probably 
weather worn enough to know that's not going to happen in our lifetime. So we do need to work within the limitations of what we've got um, and find a way that we can sensibly integrate care from one sector to another. And uh, I think one of the biggest challenges um, for us is just trying to avoid um, a sense that somehow there's cherry picking or there's unfair distribution of funding. That's always a criticism that's um, thrown in the way of, of any new initiative, that there'll be some winners and losers out of um, any changes. One of, one of the things I, I think that uh, we really struggle with is just the inertia around trying to drive any sort of improvement or change. The current system's complex. So people, people feel like they've just got their head around how it works now and changing again is just gonna complicate things more for me. So I just wanna stick with what I've got. And that inertia makes it really hard to drive sensible change. So what we often find in healthcare, unfortunately, is that it really takes a bit of a crisis in order to drive change. And one of the things we have seen is that COVID has been a bit of a, an impetus for change. It was the crisis perhaps that we needed to have. Um, and it has done things like really uh, raising people's awareness of the value of care at home, that care in a hospital is not always where you want to be if you can find um, a way to get good quality care outside a hospital setting. And I think it's allowed us to think innovatively about how we might change healthcare and healthcare settings and therefore the funding that follows that. But we do need to um, help people move beyond the initial inertia to embracing the opportunities that, that can come with change. And do you think that inertia it, it, it reflects the, the complexity of the current system so pe that people feel it's complicated enough as it is, let alone trying to do something new on top of that or evolve to, to something new? But despite that, it is going to evolve though, isn't it? That, yeah. That's just the reality. Yeah. And I think it's about, it's you know, it's sort of change management 101. We've got to spend the time bringing people on the journey of why the change is happening and why the change is needed, rather than just announcing a big change and expecting everybody to get on board because, it, you know, that everybody knows that's not the way that you really ha have a successful change management program. Oh, interesting. So, uh, Zoe, I might just go to you finally on this question about what challenges might uh, exist or can be expected when, when we, as we see activity-based funding sort of evolve with the, with the newer funding tools? Look, I think the other panellists have touched on it, but one thing that I'm very mindful of is just challenges around integration. If we, again, take a patient lens, um, if they, for example, have private health insurance in one episode of care, they could go through community, primary, public and private healthcare settings with no one stakeholder having visibility over that journey, other than obviously the patient who's made. And so understanding our costs, um, that alone then the funding is actually really complex when we don't have that joined up view. It's also not necessarily a great experience for um, the patient because no one individual or stakeholder is responsible for informed financial consent. And certainly in some of our chronic disease uh, management where it's a, a journey, so to speak, um, that can actually be really challenging because uh, there can be significant expenses over a, a duration of period of time without anybody actually being able to let the patient know what to expect and what's coming in the next 12 months, let's say. So I think that continuity um, is a real challenge in the current system that we have, but a real opportunity for us to make some significant improvements. I also think we need to think about the funding models and the behaviours they may drive. So activity-based funding, for example, is fantastic if you want immunisation, so you want activity. Um, there is a risk in some situations that it could drive low value care. So this is care that's not necessarily resulting in great outcomes. And therefore, how do we think about, again, what is the care best care model and how do we design the funding models around that to support those outcomes? So that's a really good question that I might actually put to the rest of the panellists. How do we how do we evolve activity-based funding so that it doesn't uh, result in low value care? I think that's a really important point. So maybe Alistair, I might ask you to address that. What can be done to, to mitigate as much as possible that so activity-based funding isn't funding care that is of, of less value? 
Uh, I mean, I think I think it's a good question, and I might just start briefly with an anecdote because I think you know, we've been talking about care integration. We've been talking about con, uh, hand in, the private and public sector working hand in hand. We're running a little bit of a trial at the moment. Uh, I hope will uh, end up as a as a funded model going forward, and that is uh, to look at physicians reaching into both primary and residential aged care to deal with complex patients. And a good example was a lady I saw. Uh, as part of this trial, you know, referred to me by a GP with multiple complex problems, all of which were in need of urgent care, but none of which could constitute an emergency. Um, and she was in a residential aged care facility. I went out, I saw her, we had a look at all the options, whether we could keep her there or whether we couldn't. Um, uh, where, the, where the GP's only other option at the time was to call an ambulance and send her to the emergency department, we were able to broker a bed in, pri in, in a private hospital with an appropriate physician looking after her, and she bypassed those steps uh, of draining the public health system and, and becoming uh, a, a statistic in access block. Um, so there are there are models that we're start starting to look at to uh, to coordinate um, care in the community by pushing the and I think that's the direction that this should be taking to uh, to the point of you know, that was the value of the care in those circumstances was that this lady saw a physician, got a problem sorted out, got transferred to an appropriate environment, um, and, uh, and and hence you know, got good value for the dollar as opposed to you know, as opposed to the emergency department, and you know, which would have given her good care, but. You know, given that she wasn't an emergency, that wasn't really the So she wasn't like, acutely unwell enough to, to need to be in an emergency department? She, she wasn't yet, she wasn't yet. Mm. She's somebody who in a week's time would probably have had to be in an emergency department with potentially irretrievable heart failure mm. um, but um, and, and kidney failure. But the fact that you know, the GP couldn't access that sort of uh, care in the public sector without sending it to the emergency department uh, is a is a problem for our for our strain front door uh, around around the country at the moment. And so, just before we move on, can you just explain with that system how the funding model works? So, so how did that? Uh, how it's did really, that? Yeah, it's Red Inc. as a, as a trial and that's been supported by my uh, Department of Health, and uh, and we're doing it in a single corridor out of uh, from our uh, hospital. We're looking at the GPs in that single corridor. We're looking at the residential aged care facilities in that corridor, uh, but. It, and you know, and we would like to think that if it develop if it shows efficacy that we will be able to look at other models to help fund it. And how are you? Um, just we'll move on in a second, but I'm just interested. How are you? How are you going to measure whether that um, model is a success, or what are the what are the parameters that you look at to say yes, this well, this worked? I mean, I think we can we can look at you know the. The avoidable admissions from that uh, from that particular corridor, uh, but a lot of uh, this will be measured in yeah, in, in patient-based um, outcomes uh, mm -hmm. and satisfaction of the service. Uh, there's no doubt that you know, the, the general practitioner who did the referral you know, fully appreciated the fact that you know, the, the streamlined care for this lady. And you know, and as we analyse what would have happened had he had to put her in an ambulance, we can uh, we can look at the cost differential that way. Oh, that sounds really interesting. So we'll definitely be keen to follow that up and find out um, how that trial goes. So we'll just go to some of the other panellists to just about this issue of avoiding low value care. Maybe Robert, I might ask you, because um, I know that's something that the Commission looked at was the issue, you know, was very interested in the issue of low value care as well. How, how do we uh, tweak models or ensure that the current system isn't, isn't prioritising or allowing low value care to happen? So I think one of the one of the really important things is to describe what what good looks like. All right. So there are parts of our health system where we which are high volume procedures where we know what good looks like. So, for instance, work around colonoscopy, and we we know that uh, it, unless you've got uh, multiple polyps, then you don't need a colonoscopy every year. Yet there are pockets in Australia where people are having colonoscopies every six months. Uh, so that's clearly over, you know, over servicing those patients and giving them procedures that they don't need uh, and therefore leading to extra cost and, and poor value. Uh, so I think one of the important things is to describe what good's like, good really looks like and then try and make a model of care that funds what good is. Um, one of the funding models that, that IPA has looked at and uh, has partly tried uh, and may readdress in the future is um, is uh, best practice pricing. Uh, 
So instead of pricing for some for a, a procedure just as a flat fee, actually say, well, here are the important bits of this of the care that someone say with a fractured neck of femur needs. Let's fund that and give people who perform that an appropriate amount of money to do that. And people who don't give best practice care get get being paid less. So there are technique. Uh, technology like that, that or techniques like that, the funding system could help uh, drive uh, good clinical practice and uh, reward appropriate clinical practice. Um, one of the big problems in deciding whether things are low value is often things that are, that are described as low value uh, are put in that category because there's a lack of evidence around, uh, around outcomes. And um, uh, you know, a lack of evidence doesn't mean that there, there necessarily is no that there's no value in that procedure or that care. And so we really have to be careful around how we look at that and making sure that we don't. You know, there for almost everything, there are some patients who will benefit from things that we would describe as low value care. You know, a, a classical one is spinal surgery. Mm. Uh, there are patients who undoubtedly need spinal surgery and will benefit greatly from that. And there are others who present with back pain and get uh, into a surgical pathway way too early without looking at all the other things you might do like physiotherapy, weight loss, uh, psychology, pain relief and exercise and so on. Mm. Uh, so I think really got to be, what we really do need to do is describe appropriate pathways of care and fund those pathways and then I think consumers will gravitate to those pathways rather than going off and having interventions that, that would be described as low value. I think that I think the pain the analogy that you just gave is a really good one because um, I, I do a little bit of work in the pain area as well and um, people are desperate to find out the cause of their pain. <clears throat> and if they if they get on the trajectory of say going to be sent from the GP to say a like an, an orthopedic surgeon or a spinal surgeon um, and the surgeon says oh I can see something on this scan yes you better have surgery that they, they will jump at that opportunity thinking that that's going to solve their problems and and the reality is that it, it very well may not and may cause a lot more problems um, the worst they would on a different trajectory say for example uh, you know to see a pain psychologist or someone who might help them deal with the the psychosocial aspects of pain um, that could put them on a very different um, outcome altogether. So yeah, that's a really good example. So we'll quickly go through to uh, just staying on low value care. Maybe Linda, did you want to um, talk about that? Yeah, hi. Um, look, I completely agree. Ideally, what we do is we have a model that rewards outcomes. Um, that's complex. It requires us agreeing on what are good outcomes. And what we've found um, from our experience of trying to measure and um, fund for outcomes is that it really has to be clinician-led. It's um, very hard for the funder to come up with suggestions about what are good outcomes or what we should pay for good outcomes. So trying to find a way that you get the uh, relevant health professionals incentivized to agree on what are good outcomes um, and then to agree to measure and report on them would be part of the success. So I think there's, in an ideal world, we move make a commitment to move part of the funding to outcomes and you know we know that funding drives behavior once it's clear that there will be payments for outcomes there might be more um, desire to get involved in the work to define those outcomes and to align around measuring and reporting them so we've got only about 15 minutes left and um, we've had a lot of questions from the audience. So I think we might go to the audience questions now just so they can get through as many as possible. So I won't ask each of you all the questions, um, but I might just pick one or two people. <laughs> Otherwise, we won't have time. Uh, one, one of the issues that's come up in this panel is the level of um, understanding about activity based funding and what it means. And, We've got a question from Kylie who asks, why isn't um, activity-based funding taught in some capacity at universities for clinical staff? Um, she's saying we provide a lot of education and orientation and for the new staff, the new staff, and it's always, it comes as a bit of a surprise to the staff. It's, that's the first they've heard of it. So maybe uh, who would like to address that issue of education? A Alistair, did you want to address that? I can talk to it briefly. I mean, I think there's no doubt that you know, that activity-based funding, as um, uh, as a system, uh, is 
relatively new if you look at the gestation of our medical staff uh, within and clinical staff within the hospitals. You know, I mean, we're talking about people whose education in healthcare you know, started you know, between 12, 12 and 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly the implementation of, uh, of activity-based funding has here has been um, more recent than in, in many of the states has been more recent than that. Having, but also having said that, the the important aspect for a clinician is not necessarily understanding the dollars. It's per, it's providing the appropriate models of care and making sure that the documentation of those models of care and, and hence uh, the coding uh, to determine the activity is accurate. And that is uh, and the importance of good documentation. The importance of all those things, to some extent, is taught. I think it would be interesting for the uh, for healthcare professionals um, you know, across the spectrum to understand activity-based funding um, better. But I think it does need to start start with the model of care. And if the model of care is right, then you you adapt the funding system to provide the correct model of care. And oh, thanks, Alice. And this is another question really about education. And um, it's Michelle's asking. This is for a doctor, to, for Dr. Swan. Um, she's saying, I accept that doctors shouldn't be required to understand funding, um, but do you, do you believe they need to have at least an understanding of what um, some procedures or, or you know things like prosthesis or stents cost? Is that is that important? Do you think, or, or that shouldn't be a factor in in, in decision making? Oh, look, I'm. I'm certainly all for greater transparency about what are the costs of care. I think um, prosthesis is a really interesting example. I think it's widely recognised that we pay far too much in the private sector for prosthesis. Um, that's been known for years, but actually trying to get some agreement about how we might recover those costs for patients, for people, um, you know, the commitment that private health insurance sector has made a commitment that any dollars saved from prosthesis costs will go back to patients, back to members. Um, but yet we still cannot get past that inertia of fear of change, fear that someone's going to lose in the current system. And um, it's seen to be a victimless crime. You know, there's it's free to the patient, it's free to the hospital, it's free to the surgeon. The only person who pays is the insurer in many people's minds. People aren't then um, collating that to the fact that your private health insurance premiums are going up year after year. So mm. I really do think that greater transparency to people that make the decisions about these high cost um, procedures or procedures is a critical part of how we can deliver some change. So thank you, Dr. Swan. Uh, there's another question about um, from Ab Hidenbaum, and he's asking, would it help the clinicians if there was a clear data-backed connection between the, the clinical documentation and the codes that were generated? He's saying there seems to be a disconnect between the clinical documentation and the final codes that are generated. So who would like to, to address that, that question? Come on, jump in. <laughs> um, maybe let's go to Alistair again. Come. On. Uh, I, there is potentially a disconnect, but I think you know both. Uh, uh, but uh, I think that is uh, good documentation and good consistent documentation, and uh, and uh, effectively a lexicon of appropriate um, uh, language. Uh, will draw that together, and uh, IP has done quite a bit of work to look at getting the co getting the documentation right. It's provided you know, apps, etc., to try and look at. Uh, the way in which the documentation reflects in the coding effectively, and and certainly if you if we were investing in uh, in education, um, it's it, for clinical staff investing in education on appropriate standardised documentation uh, that translates into coding would be uh, money well spent. Now this is an interesting. We, we we touched on this slightly earlier, but I think it's it might be useful just to draw it out a little bit. And Sharon's asking the definition of avoidable has changed over the years and now seems to be included in every hospital admission within the time frame. What happened to the consideration of end stage disease that means patients are expected to return but not planned, especially when due to lack of primary care options? So how do we manage those those nuances um, when you're when you're talking about avoidable? Um, Robert, did you want to cover that? So mostly it's potentially avoidable, not actually necessarily avoidable. So it's potentially avoidable. Uh, so uh, within the system, no one believes that everyone with uh, 
uh, chronic obstructive airway disease can have a cannot have admit won't have admissions to hospital for their chronic obstructive airway disease. But potentially, some of those admissions will be avoidable, and that would be avoidable by appropriate uh, primary care, by appropriate outreach from the acute care, uh, by case coordination, by um, you know often uh, nurse case coordination, and so on. Uh, so it's always potentially avoidable rather than absolutely avoidable. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if we could bring down the rates of admission for uh, many of the chronic diseases just by 20%, we would save a lot of the bed block that Alistair was mentioning occurring in his hospitals uh, because uh, the hospitals are full of people who uh, have chronic diseases, are comorbid, they've got multiple, multiple, multiple chronic diseases, they're all interacting. And uh, without integration between primary care and acute care, uh, they're just going to keep coming into the hospital. It's not in their interests. They decondition, they lose muscle bulk, they, they're away from their family and, and their home and their loved ones. Uh, so we really do need to work out how to integrate the system better. So we've only got about nine minutes left and there was one, there's one I think that I did want to ask most of the panellists before we wrap up and that's um, the the Addendum looks at reform principles um, and sets out some reform principles, things like empowering people through health literacy, prevention and well-being, and driving best practice through data and en enhanced health data. And I wanted to ask um, you from a clinician's point of view, how can these uh, reform principles be brought uh, into practice? What are the challenges and what are the opportunities when you look at some of these, particularly things like, say, you know, one thing that I'm very interested in is prioritising prevention, but then also, you know, um, en enhanced health data is also another very, very important issue. Um, maybe we'll go to Cathy. Um, I might get you to comment on some of those. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so there's a lot of motherhood statements actually in that addendum, and I think that's one of the problems is that we use very vague and flowery language sometimes when we're talking about this. But um, what's going to engage clinicians the most is, is really talking about reducing hospital acquired complications, improving outcomes, rather than focusing so much on the funding side of it. So I think it's it's very much that the reason we're doing this, you, you start with why are we doing this? We're doing this to make the, the outcomes for the patients and the, the consumers better. And then the funding flows logically from that. And if, if that can happen, that's going to really, um, really make sure that we're engaging with people at the right time. And I think uh, just, just on the unplanned return to hospital, look, one of the things that, that is the most important there is continuity of care. And I think that's one of our biggest issues, isn't it? It's a fragmentation and the poor communication. And unless we had, you know, some glorious electronic medical held, patient held medical record that was working beautifully across all of Australia, you know, that's the sort of, you know, uh, future future goal that will really assist with that continuity of care and it is astounding how many times uh, say a resident of an aged care home needs to see a GP in continuity in order to keep those chronic conditions really ticking along well mm. so um, I think they're you know me measuring the variation in in healthcare provision across the spectrum I think is a really good way and and a little bit earlier as well at trying to come up with a better way of funding that Yes, and, and the Commission did, did put out, I think it was last week, the Atlas of Healthcare Variation as well, which um, did mention some of the some of the health conditions that we've discussed in this in this session actually, like COPD and other things, which is really interesting. So um, so I might just go to some of the other panelists to ask about these um, these reform principles. Um, maybe Linda, I might just go go to you next. So some of these like prevention and enhanced health data, how what do you see as the opportunities to, to bring those into to being and, and the challenges as well? I think along with Nirvana, the other um, area would be a really significant investment in preventative healthcare in Australia. I think that's a gap that we would all love to see get better funding. Um, in the private health insurance sector, we've obviously got a very vested interest in trying to keep our members as um, healthy and well but there are um, funding regulations and uh, restrictions around what we can and cannot fund, which make it unnecessarily complex. Um, but nonetheless, there is across the sector a lot going on to try and do what we can to help inform people about 
um, healthy uh, eating, healthy lifestyle habits. Um, we can do that through, we've got a Live Better program. It's uh, a program that encourages people through points or, or some reduction in their premiums if they follow healthy behavioural changes. But we've also um, continuing to expand what we can do in terms of actually delivering some early care for people in the home or some preventative care for people in the home. So um, increasingly health insurers are now funding programs like um, rehab at home mm. or chemotherapy at home, dialysis at home, all of which enable people to get an experience of care that's um, delivered for them in the home where they want it rather than necessarily always needing to occur in a high cost hospital setting. So I think there that the, the types of changes that we're seeing around people, um, ideally health insurers would be less focused on, on avoiding just hospital costs, but currently that's primarily what we're responsible for. I think we need some reform to the private health insurance sector to really enable us to um, fund and support true preventative care at a much higher level. Well, that, that would be a, probably a win-win for, a win-win for patients as well. Um, so I'll just go, uh, Robert, I might go to you on this issue about, um, about these other reform principles, uh, your views on the opportunities and the challenges that they might, uh, that these reform principles might entail if they're, you know, brought in gradually. So I think the really good thing about the National Health Reform Agreement is that it's all the states and territories and the Commonwealth all signing saying these are all our priorities. Mm -hmm. And so that means that things like potentially preventable hospitalisations, like integration of primary and acute care, gets on the agenda of both the Commonwealth Minister and all the state ministers and the territory ministers. So I think that's actually really important. I think it allows people to think outside the square. We've heard that Alistair's running a trial in Tasmania around how you might integrate care across those sectors for patients uh, in a in a, a uh, area around his hospital. There are similar things happening in each of the jurisdictions looking at how you might better service patients, these comorbid patients, give them services that allow them to stay at home, that optimise their care, that recognise that ultimately they will need to come into hospital at times and that shouldn't be, shouldn't be penalised, but mm. that, that integration of care is in fact uh, an, is a cheaper and better way to support people's health than to have them bouncing in and out of hospital the whole time and, and in fact adding to the complexity of the hospital system. Uh, so I think the while uh, the language may be flowery, the idea that has been signed off by all the states and territories and the Commonwealth is actually really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is driving the health departments of each of the jurisdictions to do stuff uh, along with IPA to look at how, how you might have capitated funding and so on uh, to improve uh, patients' care and improve that patient journey. So I think it's great. We've only got another two minutes left. So I'll quickly go to Alistair just on this on this last issue and then we'll need to wrap up. But so Alistair, what's your what are your what's your view on the challenges and the opportunities of, of these new reform principles as we've talked about? Uh, I mean I think the situation in hospitals uh, is that you know no trying to do a, a bad job, but I think all of the, and everybody's trying to give optimal health care to their patients. But I think the these initiatives have allowed an investment in, in, in better analysis by quality and safety areas within hospitals so that we get a picture of, uh, of where things don't go right and an opportunity to review this much more effectively than perhaps we did. It, you know, arrangement has incentivized um, getting better data, getting better uh, clinical education, reviewing cases much more effectively I think than we've done in the past and uh, and therefore changing our changing our modus operandi and our models of care as, as required. So I think that's been really good, better data and a better opportunity to, uh, to look at these things. From a prevention perspective I don't think there's any doubt that uh, you know, that there's a long lead time on this and that it, it lies in the community. We've only got one minute left and I wanted to say, sorry, Alistair, I could talk about prevention for the next half an hour, but I've got to wrap up and say thank you to everyone for a great session. Professor Alistair McDonald, Dr. Robert Herkes, Dr. Linda Swan, Dr. Zoe Weiner, and Kathy Jones. It's, um, I've learned a lot. I think it was fascinating. Um, there's obviously some changes to come, but it was a very engaging and informative discussion for our audience. So we really appreciate it.
And uh, if you're interested in, in some of what we've talked about, tune in tomorrow for our panel discussion. We're going to be talking about some, some of these issues in a bit more detail with some of the state-based health leaders. But thank you so much. It's been a really interesting discussion and I'm sure the audience really values having uh, all your expertise and, and being so generous with your time. So thanks very much.